Now, this set of lore videos will likely be crazier sounding than the previous ones, and there's one thing this does well is crazy. The year is 984-12. Time was not on the side of Dante and the Damned Dozen, hasn't it? Certainly not when they got closer to, well, closer to the nest of District 20, where it was sepia monochrome. When they arrived at Wuthering Heights, a place that Heathcliff just lived in and ran away from when he believed that Catherine didn't want him, and so there was nothing keeping him there. Where the occasion that he was invited for there was a will reading due to Catherine dying, resulting in what was revealed to be a three-way conflict between Linda's company, Hindley, who was Catherine's brother, who was resentful towards Heathcliff because he saw him as the reason why he didn't have the violin as a child, and believed that it was his fault that his life spiralled downwards, ignoring his own inability to improve. He distorted into a lupine form and had to be put out of his misery. Finally, there was Linton, who was Catherine's widower, who found out that he was just a backup, because Heathcliff was the one that Catherine cared about the most, rendering his efforts to devalue Heathcliff's worth, worthless. He sacrificed himself to carry out the plan as intended, as there was no way that they could get Heathcliff to be a part of that. Linton himself was a pawn in Encorp's flat to bring a variant of Heathcliff to their world. This group of Encorp personnel was led by Asia, one of Yi Sang's former associates, that's also under Encorp's employ, and Hindley himself was a pawn of El King Heathcliff, the variant that sought to kill all variants of himself, and all those that made his life a misery, due to Catherine slowly killing herself in his universe. In the end, Catherine either had her existence erased or was well, she just had her memory of her existence erased throughout the multiverse. With only Heathcliff, Dante, who was a part in this due to resonating with three golden bars. One on the rooftop, one in the coffin, and one in his head. Well, in their head. The last one was Demian, due to him being more than human based on what he's demonstrated so far. But not before Heathcliff told her what he should have told her a long time ago. If he was more patient to completely hear her out on that day. But then, they had a problem with time tax. Due to Dante developing the ability to generate a time dilation field, within an area that TD4 protocol was in effect. Yes, Wuthering Heights had that and only activated it on special occasions. Thankfully, they investigated and apprehended a distortion known as the Time Ripper to have that time tax wavered. He turned out to be someone that was greatly affected by his brother getting run over due to not having enough time to get out of the way of the vehicle, and resentful of those with too much time on their hands, wasting it. During this, they encountered the District 20 branch of the Eurodevia, and found out that Rodia's former associates had expanded their operations citywide, making her doubt the choice that she made in District 10, then, they travelled by warp train to District 16, a place that, if Sinclair's story is any indication, is 
It has a quite relaxed attitude towards prosthetics, but before they could get there, they needed to deal with a couple of blood fiends. Sasha, who was a fixer and a seventh kindred blood fiend who was turned in order to spare her life, and Cassetti, a sixth kindred that, well, he was fleeing his family. It turned out that this was a doomed battle due to death being suspended while the warp train was in operation. So Faust and Dante went to Mephistopheles to make a deal with him. Sadly, Don Quixote was the only other one that was conscious and she took objection to this. Cassetti was annoyed by this and decided to make her another kindred. Sadly, this turned out to be a fatal mistake on his part. Don Quixote was revealed to be a second kindred, one who greatly outranked him, whose true self decided to liquefy him, her shoes being limiters and also allowed her to pass for human, which she reverted into with no memory of her true self remaining. Once she put them back on, yes, this was suppressed along with her blood feed. Then they arrived at District 16. Although due to the Master Keycard being unusable, Faust had to get creative to cut the time by thousands of years to 10 real-time seconds, which she had good practice with, considering that outside Mephistopheles, she was unable to access the Faust network within the warp train leaving her more emotionally vulnerable during that time, but didn't want anyone but Dante to know that. Although, the main problem I had was the monolith, specifically that Limbus Company sold it to Hubert, the chief executive officer of T-Corp, the one in charge of it, and artifacts that can force people to distort. Now, I theorized that this monolith was a part of how what would become Lobotomy Corporation made abnormalities, at least before Cogito was created, that substance that can bring forth concepts of the mind into physical reality. As it was hinted that a distortion could turn into an abnormality if it was near the monolith for too long. Yeah, so it's possible that Carmen might have had this developed, operated remotely with a remote or robots that didn't have AI that could pass the human as an early experiment. And sometime after that, Cogito was discovered. There is also the possibility that it might be Convergent research, something that's on a similar line to how Cogito was discovered, but completely unrelated to Carmen. Anyway, there's clearly something to deal with in District 16, a place with gleaming skyscrapers in the north of the city. Whatever it is, that's what will be found out by all those within Mephistopheles. Also, I'll be translating Don Quixote's speech pattern into something more modern. And no, I'm not going to do all of this in Shakespearean English. That'd just be annoying, wouldn't it? This story starts with someone speaking of the night approaching quickly. Yet they shall open a path, cutting through the shadows, with the incomparable blessings and approval of their family. They shall challenge and vanquish all perilous things and reach true happiness, all to make the magnificence of their adventure shine. Then a different voice said that this was their adventure as well, asking if the words were remembered. A fixer must maintain a head clear of corruption, speech free of deceit, and conduct guided by clemency to show courage in adventure and bear pain and suffering. Also, not to forget the mercy for the downtrodden. Lastly, to pursue their dream 
even if it risks their life. Now, this is the antithesis of what a typical fixer is, as corruption is systemic, even in some parts of the associations. Deceit is as natural to your typical fixer as breathing and clemency. <laughs> That's a form of mercy that some would see as weakness. Courage? Quite a few fixers would run away at the first sign of trouble and would rather avoid pain than bear it. They don't give a single about anyone but themselves. Most fixers give up on their dreams due to simple survival. This other voice made it clear that if they fail to stand by even one of these tenets, they'll smack them upside the head themselves, telling them to steal themselves and always keep moving forward. Then the first voice asked, Is that not an unfair threat? Then we get back to the warp trade station. Around the time where we last left off, when, well, when Don Quixote saw that it was unfair of Dante, and Dante didn't know what she was talking about, then she angrily made her anger clear. Dante asked her, what was it this time? Don Quixote believed that for once, she believed that it was her time to shine. She wanted to deliver the final blow to appear in the newspapers. Dante silently understood her regarding that as the warp trade station that they were in. Within the nest of District 16, being a constant reminder of the incident within the warp trade involving the Blood Fiend Cassetti. She complained about this a few times by now. She then asked why the dour expression on their face. Dante made it clear that there's no expression, no face. She disputed this, seeing all things blessed with existence, having hearts. When small creatures and blades of grass that most people don't bother to consider... The existence of a heart necessitates an expression. They mustn't let the strength of the body be how someone's measure is judged. The unbending heart is a tool with justice being dispensed. This frustrated Heathcliff, asking who encouraged her this time? Don Quixote continued to encourage Dante, or at least try to. Then we're reminded of what happened in the freight car inside the warp train. They were in Mephistopheles. Cassetti was... liquidated. Don Quixote, the second kindred blood fiend, was silent. Dante asked her if she could hear them. To say something, she silently regarded them. Dante was unsure of what she was as she gazed at them. They felt that they shouldn't listen to her as she opened her mouth, but Dante wanted to hear her out. She asked if something had ended. Dante, unsure of what she was talking about, told her that they don't think it's ended. Don Quixote understood this and called for Rocinante. This satisfied her for now, but Dante wasn't fully aware of what was... Well, what that meant. They put her shoes back on and made a silent wish to not let the blood-red eyes ever open again. Then she woke up at the warp train station specifically on one of the platforms, and noticed that they'd arrived, asking where Cassetti went. Dante tried to calm her down 
and asked if he had been struck down. Then we get back to the presents. Roger felt like they all missed out on something cool. Wanting to be there with Faust and Dante, when it all went down to see how Cassetti was killed. Or it reminded them of someone else in the story. Don Quixote was there, embarrassingly passed out like a coward in front of that blood fiend. Seeing her as the shame of Limbus Company, Rishi said S-O-L-C, an abbreviation of that, calling it pathetic. Heathcliff was more understanding as they all passed out as well. This annoyed Don Quixote. Utis believed that she should have been there to take the reins of the others. Sinclair asked if she was that scared of the blood fiend, understanding if she was. Don Quixote, being used to this treatment, told them that a true hero stands still and calm unmoving in front of the that base mockery. Ishmael agreed with Roger regarding missing something big. They got there in the aftermath, seeing a very confused-looking Dante standing over the blood fiends. Exploded, melted, parts. Dante was puzzled by this description. Don Quixote asked, why didn't they wake her? She would have forgiven them for slapping her conscious. Sinclair wanted to know what happened there. Dante reminded them that they already told them earlier. Well, the cover story is telling them that the one they've been traveling with all this time was a blood fiend. It wouldn't sound good, would it? Certainly not for Don Quixote and not for Dante. Faust and Virgilius for keeping this from them. Ishmael gave a summary of this as training off as that's, uh, you know, until the subject was changed. Wanting to know what was being talked about. Uotis was concerned that Dante was in a similar state of explosive delirium as what they experienced before, like when their head burst into flames. Ah, the April Fool's event where, well, when Dante viewed other versions of themselves and Virgilius in other worlds that were references to other mobile games, including one where Virgilius had a horse's head. Dante denied this, nervously, due to Urusis glaring at their head as if it was going to explode at any time. They assured her that it didn't happen this time. Radia was hesitant to believe that, reasoning that if Dante won't talk, then she'd turn to the second eyewitness, Faust, wanting statements from her. Radia, don't give up your day job as you're not that good a detective. Faust had no idea... Well, sorry... That's incorrect. She had no information that she sees as necessary to share right now. So Roger went back to Dante. Then, thankfully for Dante, Virgilius, the Red Gaze, had an announcement to make, telling them to pay close attention. Yes, this was definitely something of a relief for Dante. He told them that they have been contracted by P Corp to work on a case there, as they are aware. They should know what's coming by now. Heathcliff understood this to mean that they'll fight whatever the higher-ups want them to fight, whether it be distortions or abnormalities or whatever threatens their lives, asking if that's correct. The excitement of the deranged sinner was clear. Virgilius saw no further elaboration was necessary based on how even the most dense and the most deranged of the damned dozen were able to catch on quickly. Although this operation would be somewhat different. 
No, drastically different from anything they've done so far. It must be one of their more, well, <laughs> more bothersome missions. Yes, one of the most bothersome missions they've done so far. Let's see. They've worked with a fixer office that ended up betraying them in District 4. They've been terrible infiltrators of a casino in District 10. They've had to help Sinclair deal with his trauma at his hometown of Kor, burned to the ground, thanks to a psychotic that ruined his life. Be unqualified counsellors to a fast food restaurant owner, along with dealing with corporate intrigue in District 11. Take care of mutant crabs, the middle, and Ishmael's former associates on the Great Lake in District 21. Deal with a gang war, a variety of different kinds of distortions in District 20. While dealing with Heathcliff's past and a hefty time tax bill. Then taking care of blood fiends on the warp train to District 16. So it's hard to imagine how much more bothersome this one could be. Ishmael more or less asked, What else is new? She saw it as bothersome to tag along with a group of, well, that's two to three times larger than theirs. Faust is impressed by how fast they catch on. Ishmael was suspecting that Faust was patronising her discouraging her from guessing from that point onwards. Virgilius informed them that it's not something that can be negotiated, asking that, well, if it's better to join a group three times their size rather than oppose it. Now, forgive me for not being entirely optimistic, but as far as working with others is concerned, it's not a good track record. In District 4, there was one that betrayed the damned dozen and the surviving fixes that was part of the office for simple greed while leaving everyone to die, stealing the Enkephalin. In District 10, one that let them have the Golden Bar simply because it suited them at the time. In District 11, a team was all killed except for one being given a mercy killing and the other surviving. Then in that building run by Kcorp, a former associate of Yisang's tried to kill them. In District 21, while the Mola Boatworks was actually helpful and the Indigo Elder was a good distraction, the crew of the Pequod was either betrayed by Ahab or killed by the damned dozen when she ordered them to attack. In this case, it was self-defense. Yes. Indeed, it was self-defense, and unknown to the damned dozen, Ahab is still alive. In District 20, Nelly revealed herself to be an N-Corp spy who stole the Golden Bar from when they were incapacitated. Hubert was actually helpful with his insightfulness and Sasha was revealed to be a seventh kindred, so it's a record that's mixed at best. Anyway, Urutis asked if it's a joint operation and who they were dealing with. Gregor didn't have the fondest of memories of joint operations. Yi Sang, considering Dong Rang was a part of one of them, had memories of pain. Dante remembered how disastrous their first and last joint operation with K-Corp ended. Radia was disgusted by the vivid memory of watching Masalt's arm fly off, smacking against a pillar and squelching onto a f the floor. Masol, armed with his weaponized autism, corrected her by saying that his scapula was also forcibly separated from his torso. Rodia asked if it can be kept between them. The others were just getting away. 
Yeah, experience shows that they're either more a hindrance than a help, or become threats to take care of later. Surprisingly, Ultis agreed with her. Virgilia saw this as presumptuous. They're not the only team coming into that operation with similar thoughts. The contract is an open one, posted by the Hana Association. That association that overlooks fixer operations. He stopped, based on an ominous aura coming from one of them, which turned out to be Don Quixote, who was vibrating with excitement more than an electric toothbrush would inside someone's mouth. Seeing what's coming next, Virgilius told someone to gag her quickly. Uritis offered to do this, which muffled Don Quixote. Virgilius made it clear that it won't just be fixes from offices that none have heard of. It's likely that some from established associations would be joining. Don Quixote attempted to get through the muffling sound of Ortiz without success, which was irritating to Ortiz. Dante was relieved that Ortiz would do this, as the explosion of joy would have drawn more attention to them than they'd like. Heathcliff asked what kind of monster were they dealing with this time. Ryushi wanted to know how they want it done. This disturbed Sink there, and she talks like a shady backstreet's fixer. Virgilius looked up at Heathcliff, just as he was asking this. Virgilius told them that additional details would be shared by their clients, who had only just arrived. The client saw it to be an honour to meet the Red Gaze in person. She introduced herself as Chisara, Head Manager of People, Archival. Utis asked if that meant she was in charge of bookkeeping. Chisara saw that as one way of putting it. It's a rather significant department of people. Apparently, other wings treat their archivists with less significance. Gregor understanding that if she's out there to deal with this personally, then they're putting their names out there. Chisara told him that he wasn't wrong. She did hear some things about them at Limbus Company, where she knows them as a medium-sized enterprise with its employees gladly braving death to see a contract to its end, or just to obtain the golden bars. Gregor told her that's true. Dante saw that she was making them sound impressive, which is certainly an improvement over how Virgilia sees them. Don Quixote told her that they've taken out countless evils through all kinds of hardships and deadly foes, braving death as well. She confused the others rather than pressing them. Don Quixote was infatuated by what she said. Virgilius said that they received a brief of the contract. It's a particularly <laughs> Sorry, a particularly stubborn urban nightmare case, which all kinds of fixers have failed to take care of, despite multiple attempts. Well, the damned dozen are capable of dealing with those. Although stars of the city are too much for them right now. Cesara confirmed. Virgilius doubted that it was customary for the head manager of an entire department to greet everyone looking to make a name for themselves. Kezara. Kezara, what do you want to pronounce that? Confirm this as well. Virgilius also noted that she went to lengths to privately deliver this particular contract to them. He then asked if it was not a simple urban nightmare. He saw that her expectations extended beyond simply defeating it. They must have a particular task for them to brave death for. She wasn't going to hide this from them. It felt like she's being read by him like an open book. Well, he was affiliated with the Seven Association. 
a good one for that knows how to do that. The others witnessed Virgilius skip the rest and get to the point. Cesara saw that they were quite blunt when they contracted PCOR, that there's a golden bar somewhere near the eradication targets. It apparently astonished her when she picked up the call. They refused to answer her questions, refused to tell them what these golden bars were, insisting that they let their people inside the zone to confirm the exact coordinates. She almost forced that it was a prank call. Virgilius made it clear that they made them an offer they could can't refuse. Sorry, that was terrible. <coughs> anyway, Jazara wasn't going that far. They have serious intel gathering capabilities, whether it be due to a versatile agent or due to a proactive intelligence department. Luckily, the before team. This made her slump slightly. Ishmael asked what they're eradicating this time. Given that there are hopefuls queuing up to join the mission, asking if it's an escaped abnormality, wreaking havoc somewhere, or if it's a distortion, then she realized that abnormalities and distortions were monsters that look similar at first glance, although apparently it's not just another monster to deal with. Dante noticed something that caught their attention. The missing persons flyers. Countless flyers, each in search of a different person. Take to it, well, the pillars inside the station. They're randomly going missing with no age or gender patterns. This did not escape Jezara's attention. He pointed out that they're old, faded and tattered to the point where the paper was starting to peel off. None have returned home safely. Utis asked if they're not dealing with an entity, but rather a phenomenon. Gezara told them that about a land where the happiest smiles bloom, the amusement park of fables and legends, La Mancha Land. Sinclair was unfamiliar with this place. Jezara mentioned that several dozen have been reported missing, but the number is likely much higher. Most of the guests who visited that place, which mysteriously materialized two months before, around the time that the damned dozen dealt with bamboo-hatted Kim, the Blade lineage, and the Kurokumo clan, within the back streets of District 20. As for as for the Manchaland, that appeared two months before within the back streets of District 16. They're still trapped within. This caught Don Quixote's attention, as it's against the nature of amusement parks, as they're meant to be for the joy, not horror. Jezara made it clear that she lacked enough manpower under her authority to deal with it. It was an urban plague three days after its first appearance. It was now an urban nightmare. Virgilius asked if it was an urban nightmare, not a star of the city. Shouldn't Picor be able to handle it easily? Cesara then made it clear that Picor is divided into different factions, each with their own interests. The other departments had no interest in La Mancha Land, so the Marshal Department wouldn't send their elite employees to handle this. Don Quixote found this hard to believe that Peacorp won't deploy their elite forces to swiftly vanquish the threats that poses to the surrounding area and protect the innocent. Chisara really had Don Quixote's attention, who enjoyed her excessive, almost Theatrical reaction. Jezara made it clear that it's because that it's in the back streets, and unless it causes mass destruction that risks the nest, they won't deal with it. To put it into perspective, if it happened in the nest, the elite, well, <coughs> the elite 
agents from the compression department would have descended on it the moment it appeared. I think we can guess what method of attack they do, and possibly what singularity P Corp has. Virgilius wanted to get on with it, asking Gisela, what more was she hiding? It wouldn't be hard for someone of her status to requisition agents from a different department, so why go through all the trouble of hiring Limbus Company? Jezara saw him as unrelenting. Apparently the goal of her department isn't the eradication of La Mancha Land. Jezara told them that soon they'll be heading into La Mancha Land with the others, advising them not to make it clear that they're after the Golden Bar. If they found out it was located there, it could attract attention from those who consider it a bounty separate from the eradication reward. No need to attract that kind of attention. That, and they should keep quiet about the true objective of the department. Ishmael understood this to mean that they should keep these details between them. They both get what they want, and they go their separate ways once their business is over. Asking if it's that so. Yes, Ishmael asked if that's so, and Jezara confirmed this. Uruz is asked who they think that they are, making it clear that when it comes to OPSEC, some of them might fall slightly behind. Virgilius made it clear that it was about time that they got to the point. They're attracting more unwanted eyes by lingering there. Jezara agreed. The mission is enter La Mancha Land, find whatever created it and bring it to her. Ultis questioned if it was someone. Masalt saw the description as insignificant. The thing or someone. Not knowing if it's organic or inorganic. Sinclair asked why eradicating it wasn't enough. Why did they need this? Jezara found this amusing as she looked at Sinclair, which made him nervous as he said, Well, he asked if he said something wrong. Jezara claimed to be flabbergasted at by this boldness of daring to ask a question like that. She wasn't asking why they were looking for the golden bars. Sinclair struggled to speak. Jezara didn't see it as a big secret. She wanted what whoever, or whatever, was behind this case to be held responsible for the damages it done. Don Quixote saw this as a case of a villain committing an atrocity, deserving of a fitting punishment. Jezara saw that as a bonus. They'll have some achievements under her belt to give her the part a little push to rise above the others, hoping for, pro for a promotion. Urtis saw that she reached an agreement with the higher-ups of Limbus Company, so it didn't matter if they agreed to this or not. Heathcliff asked, what if, after kicking it, they don't bring in whatever made La Mancha Land? Dante saw this as a reasonable question, as there is a chance that... Despite their best efforts, they could fail to bring them in. Jazara gave an implied threat that they'll start looking into the golden bars. Uritis angrily asks if they don't get them what they want, they'll get in the way. Best not. They already have to deal with enough as it is, such as N Corp and the Eurodivia. Jazara saw this as rather unnecessary and not very cost-effective research investments. But they might force their hand if they don't do as requested. Besides, while La Mancha Land is an urban nightmare now, its threat level continues to rise. More and more people are catching wind of this case. The numerous fixes gathering there are evidence enough of this. Ishmael understood this to mean that they're not the only option. Jezara understood that there are those drawn to fame and fortune. 
they'd get a truckload of willing participants if they wanted to. Some of those fixers might be interested in the golden bars. Those precious artifacts must have a particular smell that attracts fixers, like bees to honey. Ishmael understood this to mean that she wants them to take care of this before too much attention is attracted. Josara confirmed that she's true about that, again. What each desires isn't much use to the other. For now, at least. It's why they're keeping the nature of the Golden Bars discreet. It's also why they're keeping to themselves what created La Mancha Land. Ryushu understood this to mean the more that observes the info, the less value it has. Like mass-produced products. Rodia saw this as all work talk. She got excited, thinking that they were about to get some nice souvenirs. Oh, what were you thinking? A, I got my blood sucked out of me in La Mancha Land t-shirts? A plush of a cutified blood fiend? A blood donation kit? Cesare had high expectations from every one of them, as they're all willing to die for that. Dante was nervous at her keeping... Saying that, seeing this as standard procedure for them. Stability and safety aren't concerns the moment the mission starts. Well, less than usual. Cold goals and objectives. Nothing deeper than the shallowest transactions. This was seen as pointless to get around, but this was probably not the right way. While the others had dull and resigned expressions, Don Quixote had a passionate one, telling Cesara that she could put their faith in them. She and the others shall take care of the threat of La Mancha Land and rescue every single victim that it claimed. She'll also bring the creator of La Mancha Land to her. Then they shall be smited by the Hammer of Justice. Cesara saw this, or at least wanted them to see this as inspiring confidence. Which is more than can be said about most things. Don Quixote vowed to valiantly and honorably battle to etch her name in the halls of Peacorn, bouncing up and down like she was prepared to serve Gisela. Heathcliff was asking her to please stop, resisting the urge to smash her skull. Ultis noticed that she wasted no time figuring out how to turn Don Quixote into one that would follow her. Heathcliff struggled to figure out how she works. Jazara urged them to move on with their mission. Don Quixote agreed with her. Jazara couldn't go with them. She did instruct them to head to the location marked on the piece of paper that was handed to them. Don Quixote asked why this was. Seeing a journey alone is dreary. Ishmael saw it as this. If they showed up at the gathering of fixers with Jazara, it would attract more attention than superstars on the red carpet. Ah, so there's a movie industry in the city. Well, they wouldn't need to make a lot of it up, considering how outla- well, <coughs> outlandish that reality can be. Rodia understood that they'll figure out their connections to Peacock quickly, if that was the case. Yes, these words of caution were lost on Don Quixote. Gregor told her that words can mean more than one thing at a time. Jazara gave them a pass to allow them to move freely between the back streets and the nest of District 16. It's a work visa, so it won't last forever. Well, it'll last long enough for them to do what they need to in District 16. Sinclair complained that if they hand something like that so easily, why can't her department handle this themselves? The suspicion that he had was clear, but 
this was minor compared to what followed as they received their work visa. Ominous, isn't it? Well, until next time. Kill the rabbits! <laughs> <laughs>